Where's your drumsticks at? You all right? Well, good morning, everybody. How's it do? How's everyone doing? <clears throat> Hope you're having good. a great day, and uh, we're looking forward to a good day as we celebrate our Mission Emphasis Sunday a little bit. And what we're doing is, you see all the flags up there. We have a missionary in South Korea. We have a missionary in South Africa. We we support. Um, uh, Jews for Jesus as they work with Israel and uh, we let's see there we used to have a missionary in that flag back there that's Chile I think I believe and then in Kenya we have a, a children's home there that we take care of and then in India there are three different missionaries that work there that we support and then of course the United States right here we support <laughs> <laughs> we support the missions in, uh, well, we support missions through supporting uh, William Jessup University, <clears throat> who brings people from all over the world, trains them, and then sends them back out. And so we've got a handful of people. Oh, this is, which one is this one? Oh, that one is uh, Czech, the Czech Republic. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, and then Ukraine, we had, uh, Jeffrey went, worked there a little bit, uh, Nate, my ne nephew, went to check out having a children's home there, uh, that fell through, but we're, we, you know, we're praying for all the work that's going on, all, everything that's happening in, in um, Ukraine, so we'll keep them up there, so let's bow for prayer, most gracious, mighty God in heaven, I thank you so much for everyone that's here today, and as we celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that impacts the entire world and how we should be mission-minded, thinking about getting people all around the world excited about Jesus and his grace and his mercy. How all of heaven is open to all of the world. And Father God, we pray that you would bless our missionaries around this, this world and, and keep them strong and keep them safe the changing tides. India is getting harsher and harsher on, on uh, mission work, on, on Christianity. Uh, other nations are closing down. Father, we're praying that you would lift us up, that you would lift your, your kingdom up, that you would revive us and excite us about Jesus and his sacrifice for us. That we would all humbly bow before you, accepting your grace and mercy. And Father, each one here has a need, something that might be distracting them from a good and strong worship of you. And we pray that you would meet those needs, whatever they are, physical, spiritual, emotional, financial, uh, and uh, help us to live boldly in this world. Care for those people in Ukraine, Father God. Protect them from the invading country, the bullies that are coming out of the north. And Father, we pray that you would uh, be with the uh, Taiwanese who are being agitated constantly by China. We ask that you would protect them. Father, we thank you for the work that's being done in China, how the church is growing there so quickly, even though they are being persecuted as they accept you as Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for those who are struggling around the world, all those people who are coming in, oh, that we might take them, coach them, and get them to be able to go back to their homes and uh, share the gospel with the rest of the world. This is a 
big opportunity. Thank you for each one here in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Turn it over to the worship team. Please stand. To have Tara back with us. Okay, everybody say, God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Have a great worship time. Have a great worship time. I will celebrate, sing unto the Lord, sing to the Lord.
God does reign. Please be seated. John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Tomorrow is September 11th. The students that are coming in to class now um, had not yet been born when the terrorists attack occurred 22 years ago. Those people who are old enough to remember will never forget where they were when they first heard the news, when they first saw the destruction. Along with the people in the Twin Towers, hundreds of first responders also died that day. They entered the burning buildings to help evacuate them. They risked their own lives in order to rescue others. Each week at communion time, we remember the heroic sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus traveled to the scene of devastation caused by sin and was born as a baby into this world. Jesus chose to put himself in danger by deliberately going to the cross. Jesus willingly laid down his own sinless life as the redemption for our sin. This crucified and risen Jesus has the power to save all who come to him in faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your selfless love. Thank you that you did not count the cost when you came to rescue us. You gave it all. Father, we admire that, we respect that, and we love you for that. We ask you, Lord, as we take communion, that you and your spirit, that same spirit of selfless love, would become a part of us just as these elements will become a part of us so that we demonstrate your love toward the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus invites all who follow him to participate in this remembrance of his sacrifice. On the night that he was was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and he said to his followers, take this and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Likewise, again, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant, the new covenant the new agreement between God and humanity written in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. John Piper is a New Testament scholar theologian, college chancellor, author, and pastor. I would like to quote extensively from the sermon that the Reverend Dr. John Piper gave the Sunday after September 11, 2001. How shall I strengthen your hope this morning? The American political system is not imperishable. The American military cannot protect us from every destructive force. The financial future is not certain, and you may lose your investments. 
The Midwest is not safe from the next kind of terrorism, which may be more pervasive and more deadly. The psychological efforts to feel competent and avoid regret are not healing, but fatal. And eschatological scenarios that promise escape from suffering under God's end time providence didn't work for the Christians in the World Trade Center last Tuesday, and they won't work for you either. I will not gloss over how utterly vulnerable we are in our earthly existence. Our hope is not in the military and its ability to protect us from all danger. Our hope is in Christ. Amen. And nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. We serve a God who is sovereign over all things. We serve serve a Christ who once looked into the cold eyes of a heartless Roman governor and said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. I am thankful that while we have no basis for confidence in military might, Psalm 20, verse 7, we have every reason to be confident in King Jesus, who has promised to come again, and to make all things new, Revelation 21, verse 5. I am th thankful for a Christ who loves sinners and who will one day banish evil from the new heavens and the new earth. This is our hope. Would to God that our nation might be gripped by this truth. It is our only hope in this life and the next. Let us give sacrificially to the work of our one and only hope. may be seated. Thank you, Patrick and Dale and Janice and Tara and Josh and Martin. Tina Fay, for all your help with us this morning, and thank you all for singing so beautifully. We join together in worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's bow for prayer. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, we come to you with the word. 
God. We thank you for the word that you've given to us. And we thank you for the messages that we get. We thank you for teaching us more about you and showing us how you want to live through the lives of others. Father, we pray that you would bless each one. Help us to live as you would have us live. Help us to dedicate ourselves to you. Help us to be devoted to your word day in and day out. Thank you for the lessons we learned from Stephen today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Jim Elliott and Nick Saint took a trip. They were in South America. They wanted to go to Ecuador and start a work in Ecuador as missionaries. And while they, when their plane landed, they flew in, because Nick was the pilot, they flew in. When their plane landed, a tribe of um, headhunters greeted them and killed them, sacrificed them to their gods. A few years later, Nick's saint's wife, Jim Elliott's wife went back and shared the message with those people. Those same men who killed their husbands. And their, their, their mission will live forever because of their sacrifice. We look today at one of the Seven men that were chosen last week. Remember we talked about the deacons that were chosen or the, the leaders that were chosen and the things that we're looking for in leaders as you all are picking out leaders. You've got another sheet of, uh, for making another election if you want of, or nomination you want for our leaders coming here out of our body and you're going to take a look at that list and you're going to say, well, this person is a godly person. This is a person that I want to, I trust to lead me. This person has a good reputation throughout the whole congregation and maybe out, even out in the community. This is the one that I want because that's how they directed uh, the apostles directed the early church to choose their first leaders, right? And among them was a man named Stephen. We go on to find out a little bit more about Stephen as we follow through. Now, this is a tough thing for me because I've, I generally don't try to take... 70 verses, 75 verses, and make a sermon out of it. But this day we will do that, and we'll be we, uh, going through the scriptures. All that we do, we see, we ha hear Stephen giving a wonderful, wonderful sermon. Oh, bummer. I forgot to bring a, to a roll of toilet paper in. Anyway, um, we're going to meet Deacon Stephen now, and imagine how all our deacons are just like this Mr. Mr. Stephen. Let's quote a passage that he quotes, or let's read a passage that he quotes in his scripture, Isaiah 66, 1 through 2, and then get to him. If you would join me, please. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hands made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Okay, so he, he brings that up, and that's kind of the theme of his sermon that he'll be preaching. He brings up the fact that God is a God who made everything that we see. He's a God who sits enthroned in heaven, and the earth is his footstool. So how in the world are you going to try to build a place for him that he can stay in? Stephen. Let's turn our attention to Stephen for a little bit. Stephen was a busy man because... Well, let's read a little bit about him. Stephen was full of God's grace and power. He did great wonders and signs among the people, but members of the group called the Synagogue of the Freedmen began to oppose him. Now, the Synagogue of the Freedmen were uh, synagogues that scattered 
throughout Jerusalem because there were people always coming to Jerusalem from other cities. And rather than making them feel awkward coming to a, a local synagogue with a local speaker, everyone speaking Aramaic and not totally understanding it, they would set up these uh, different synagogues for these people, people from Cyrene, people from Alexandria. Well, we saw a whole list in, in Acts chapter 2, all these people coming from everywhere. They would have their own synagogue to worship in because that made them feel more comfortable. Uh, so um, he would go around to these free men um, synagogues and share the gospel and discuss with them. They were open all the time. But every Saturday, he would go there and do that. So let's see. But the members of the group called the Synagogue of the Free Men began to oppose him. Some of them were Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. Others were Jews from Cilicia and Asia Minor. They all began to argue with Stephen. But he was too wise for them. That's because the Holy Spirit gave Stephen wisdom whenever he spoke. Then in secret, they talked, uh, they talked some men into lying about Stephen. They said, we heard Stephen began to speak evil things against Moses and against God. So the people were stirred up, and the elders and the teachers of the law were stirred up too. They arrested Stephen and brought him to the Sanhedrin. They found witnesses who were willing to tell lies. The liars said, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place. He also speaks against the law. We have heard him say at this, uh, at, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. He says Jesus will change the practices that Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked right at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like a face of an angel. So, first of all, you want to approach a man who is a busy man. He was a busy man. He was chosen to be one of the elders who served the tables of, of the widows of the church who were struggling. And so he would be getting up early in the morning, going to get all the food that these widows might need and handing some to everyone. He probably had a, they probably had these women divided into, oh, oh good, okay, thank you divided into several different um, uh, groups for, for those seven men, you know, seven different groups for the seven men. I don't think that they split and said, well, the, the Jewish ladies are going to be served by the apostles and the non-speaking Jew, um, the, the Jewish people that are non-Aramaic, the Judean, the uh, other this diaspora, diaspora Jews, they, they get the seven men. No, I think there's seven men, but all the ladies who were in trouble, so that everyone got the same treatment. And he was busy serving. He'd get up and do that in the morning and take the food around and the supplies of whatever was needed and then do that work. And then during the day, he would go and talk to uh, these people in the different uh, freemen uh, synagogues. Synagogue was a place, there was a temple that, the, that everyone could go worship in, but there were synagogues where, kind of like little churches and congregations, where the people, there had to be at least 10 uh, Jewish people that belonged to, uh, to that, 10 Jewish men that would belong and make a synagogue. So there was probably always that kind of thing, group going on. And he would go and he'd talk and share the gospel. And when you share the gospel, yes, you would say that that. Judaism is over and Christianity is coming. This is Jesus brought a new thing into the, into the world. So he was busy serving. You always take a busy man to get anything done, right? That, isn't that what they say? If you want something done, ask a busy man because then it will get done, right? So he was busy serving. He was also busy preaching, going around to those synagogues and sharing the gospel with everybody. And whenever he talked, people listened and they were amazed at his wisdom and how, how he shared it. He was also busy working miracles, it says, doing wonderful things. We know that he preached and therefore we know that he worked miracles to, to put value to the preaching that he did. We talked about that last week, how, how always first the word is taught and preached, and then it is backed up by the miracles. And that happens where 
the word the word is not uh, as permeated into society as it is here, right? It happens in in the wilds. It happens in other places, so that God can be he can say, "I'm affirming this person," and that's why Jesus did all his miracles. God was affirming him. That's why the apostles did their miracles. God was affirming. That's why Stephen did his. God was affirming that the message that he gave was true. So he was working all these miracles. People were bringing them along. So he was a busy man preaching and working miracles. So the high priest questioned Stephen, is, is what these people are saying true, he asked. Brothers and fathers, listen to me, Stephen replied. So this is his final statement. Because he knows that what's going to happen is he's being accused of blasphemy. And what happens when you're accused of blasphemy? You get stoned to death. That's what's going to happen. And so they said, what's your final word? And he says, oh, guys, I just have, I have a final word here for you. So just a few words. Oops, it's supposed to roll out and roll around, right? Get the idea. Oh, there you go. All just a few words. Last few words I want to say. And so he starts his his last message, putting off maybe, maybe a little bit of the time that he had to before he was stoned to death. But he had a long, beautiful message, bringing lacing all of the history of the Israelites being proud of what they had done and everybody there was proud of what they they all claimed to be descendants of Abraham they all claimed to have their fathers Judah and and uh, Benjamin and Dan and and um, Manasseh and uh, Gad all those different guys were all in charge they were all descendants of these wonderful uh, sons of Jacob who was a son of Isaac who was the son of Abraham. The high priest said, okay, brothers and fathers, listen to me, Stephen replied. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham at the time, at that time, Abraham was still in Mesopotamia. He was in Mesopotamia. He was in the Chalde, Ur of the Chaldees, right? When he started, and he had, and the, what God had told him to do was leave Mesopotamia and go west towards Israel, Canaan. Okay, so he is on the east side of the Tigris River. He's supposed to leave his family and everything except for his wife, take his wife along, uh, and leave everything and go there. Well, guess what? He didn't do that. He did leave. He left the Ur of the Chaldees, and he went north to Haran. It's still in Mesopotamia, still on the east side of uh, the Euphrates River. So our good old faithful Abraham wasn't immediately obedient, just like we kind of think. And I think that's what Stephen was pointing out. He went there and he took his dad along, or his dad took him. Uh, he got up one morning and said, Dad, I need to go to uh, Canaan. A God of this universe told me that I need to go to Canaan, this promised land. I have to leave everything behind. And he said, well, come on, hot son. I'll take you up as far as Haran. Let's go up that way. We'll stay there for a while. We'll do. We'll 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 uh, obey God that your God that way. Because his, his dad was a moon worshiper, and he had all the gods to help worship the the moon. Abraham was a moon worshiper too. But he heard this voice from God. That God had picked it up. So what, Samuel, what uh, Stephen is saying is, by the way, my friends, Abraham, were descendants of him. You claim to be a descendant. He didn't do immediately what God had asked him to do. He went up to Haran, taking his dad with him and waiting until his dad dies, okay? So they, God, the glory appeared to our father Abraham. At that, Abraham still was in Mesopotamia. He had not yet begun living in Haran. Haran is still in Mesopotamia. And then after his dad died, leave your country and go, uh, your country, your people, and God said, and go to the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of Babylonia, and he settled in Haran, still in Mesopotamia. After his father died, God said to Abraham, 
to Israel. So twice he was sent to the promised land now. Had to leave, had to make sure his dad died so that he was free to go. God didn't give any property here. He didn't even give him enough land to set his foot on. But God made a promise to him and, all, and to all his uh, family after him. He said they would possess the land. The promise was made even though at that time Abraham had no child. In fact, they were, he was still called Abram. Uh, which doesn't mean, uh, Abraham means the father of many and Abram means grand, grandfather, great father. Here is what God said to him. For 400 years, your family uh, after you will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be slaves and will be treated badly. But I will punish the nation that makes them slaves, God said. After that, they will leave that country and worship me here. And God made a covenant with Abraham. God told him the circumcision would show that who the members of the covenant were. Abraham became Isaac's father. He was circumcised. Isaac eight day, He circumcised Isaac eight days after he was born. Later, Isaac became Jacob's father. Jacob had 12 sons. They became the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Jacob's sons were... Uh, so, so now we've got the picture. He said, I've set up this promise. Now I gave it to Abraham. He's going to be the father of the whole nation. And his, everything, where he goes in, in uh, the promised land will be his and for his family. So it wasn't him. He only had one son. It wasn't going to be much for that. But then along came Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And those, those 12 sons became the father of all the different tribes that we, were, we, that we know about. Uh, so Jacob's sons were jealous of Joseph. Uh-oh, what's going on here? Why did he bring Joseph in? Because Joseph was a man chosen by God, and their forefathers rejected Joseph. He's showing a tendency, isn't he? What is the tendency of the Jewish people? Rejecting the servants of God, the chosen of God. He saved Joseph from all his troubles. God made Joseph wise. He helped him to become the friend of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made Joseph the ruler over Egypt and his whole palace. There was not enough food for all Egypt and Canaan. This brought us great suffering. Jacob and his sons couldn't find food. But Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt. So he sent his son on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was. Hey. I'm the guy you sold into slavery. And you did that so that I could be down here to get all the food ready for, your fam for the family and provide for them. On the second uh, visit, Joseph told his brothers uh, who he was. Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent uh, for his father Jacob and the whole family. Totaling, uh, total number was 75. Then Jacob went down to Egypt and there he, uh, the, he and his family died. Some of their bodies were brought uh, back to Shechem. Uh, they were placed in the tomb Abraham had bought. He had purchased it from Hamar, son of Shechem. He had to purchase it for the certain amount of money. He paid a big price for that land. And that's where he was buried. That's where his wife, was, Sarah, was buried. And that's where all the fathers were buried. That's where Rachel was buried, okay? All these people were now buried on that land that, that, that Abraham bought. He insisted on buying it. They wanted to give it to him because he was such a great man. But no, I'm buying it because it's not my land. I have to buy it from you. I don't want anything. I don't want you coming back and saying, well, look what we did to make Abraham great. You didn't do a thing. They were placed in two, uh, the tomb Abraham had bought. He purchased it from Hamor's son, Shechem. He had purchased it for the certain amount of money. In Egypt, the number of our peoples grew and grew. It was nearly time for God to make that promise to Abraham uh, come true. Then a new king came to power in Egypt. Joseph didn't mean anything to him. It's kind of like history just getting washed out. What do we care about Lincoln? What do we care about George Washington? Uh, they don't have any effect on us today, do they? And so we, that's what happened. They said, oh, Joseph, who's Joseph? He was a stranger in a strange land. We didn't want, we, we didn't, he's not our king. 
Then a new king came to power, and Joseph didn't mean a thing to him. The king was very evil and dishonest with our people. He treated them badly. He forced them to throw out their newborn babies to die. So that's how it was for Moses, I mean, for Abraham through Moses. And just there is a pattern that he is showing, that people reject God, that Israelites rejected all the things that God really wanted. At that time, Moses was born. He was not an ordinary child. For three months, he was taken care of by his family. Then he was placed outside, but Pharaoh's daughter took him home. She brought him up as her own son. Moses was ta taught all the knowledge of the people of Egypt. He became a powerful speaker and a man of action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit the people of Israel. They were his own people. He saw one of them being treated badly by an Egyptian, so he went to help him. He got even by killing the man that was attacking his Israelite brother, right? Moses thought, uh, thought his own people would realize that God was using him to save them, but they didn't. What happened? The next day, Moses saw two Israelites fighting. He tried to make peace between them. Men, you are both Israelites, he said. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was treating the other one badly punished, uh, pushed Moses to one side, and he said, Who made you our ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking uh, of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? He thought he got by with that little killing. But he, he was caught. But not only that, he thought that because he had done what he had done with the Egyptians, that the Israelites would rise up and say, Yay, we have a Savior who will free us, because he knew he had been appointed by God to do that, to free Israel. His mom probably taught him that as she was raising him. But they rejected him once again. Another leader of mankind, leader of Israel, was rejected. Appointed by God, rejected by humanity. He's establishing that pattern, isn't he? Okay, when Moses heard this, he escaped Midian. He lived there uh, as an outsider. He became the father of two sons there. Forty years passed. Then an angel appeared to Moses. This is all stuff that they would know, and probably most of you heard these stories all over again. Then the angel appeared to Moses in the flames of the burning bush. We heard that, right? Everybody heard that? That's a famous story. Uh, in the flames of burning bush, that ha this happened in the desert near Mount Sinai. When Moses saw the bush, he was amazed. He went over for a closer look. There he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. Moses shook with fear. He didn't dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals. You must do this because this is the holy place where you are standing is holy is holy ground. I have seen my people beaten down in Egypt. I have heard their groans. I have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. Oh yeah, they all know this. They're all saying, yes, amen, you're good, you're good at this, uh, Stephen. This is the same Moses the two men of Israel would not accept. They uh, had said, who made you ruler and judge? But God himself sent Moses to rule the people of Israel and set them free. The people of uh, let's see, uh, set them free. He spoke, Moses through, he spoke to Moses through an angel. The angel had appeared to him in the bush. So Moses led them out to Egypt, and he did wonders and signs in Egypt at the sea and, at, uh, and for 40 years in the desert. This same Moses who spoke to the Israelites, God will send, uh, said, you will send a prophet. He will send a prophet. He will send you a prophet. He, will, he said, he will be like me. So he's talking about Jesus right? Moses is talking about Jesus coming. He will be like me. He will set the people free and bring them into the promised land, which is the kingdom of heaven, right? He will come from their own people. Moses was with the Israelites in the desert. He was with the angels who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. Moses was with our people for long ago, of long ago. He received living words passed to him. To us, But our people refused to obey Moses. They would not accept him. In their hearts, they wished they were back in Egypt. Again, rejecting the man God sent. It was the history of Israel. 
They told Aaron, make us a God who will lead us. This fellow Moses brought us up out of Egypt, but we don't know what happened to him. That was the time that they made a statue to be their God. It was shaped like a calf. They brought sacrifices to it. They even enjoyed what they had made with their own hands. But God turned away from them. He let them go on worshiping the sun, moon, stars. This agrees with what was written in the book of the prophets. There it says, people of Israel did not bring me sacrifices and offerings for 40 years in the desert, rejecting God's man over and over again. That was the history from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to David. You've taken with you the shrine of your false god, Molech. You have taken with you the star of your false god, Repham. You've made statues of these gods to worship. So I will send you away from your country. And God sent them to Babylon even farther. Long ago, our people were in the desert. They had with them the holy tent, the tent that where the tablets were of the covenant and the law were kept. Moses had made the holy tent as God had commanded him. Moses made it like the pattern he had sent. Our people received that tent from God. Then they brought it with them, and they took the land of Canaan. God drove out the nation. Now, the tent, by the way, was God saying, I'm with you. It wasn't, you weren't supposed to worship the tent. You weren't supposed to worship any of the items of the tent. You were just to know that God was with his people there in the wilderness, and that's where they would worship him. God drove out the nations that were in their way, and at that time Joshua was Israel's leader. The tent remained in land until David's time. There it was. David, now David to Jesus. Okay, so we've got that. Now we've got the picture of all the rejection. We've got the pictures of all that God had done to try to save these people. Nothing was, was good enough for them. David was blessed by God, so David asked if he could build a house for God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house. David couldn't. Remember the story? He was too bloody. He had killed constantly. So that wasn't what God wanted. What he wanted was a man of peace. And that's what he got in Solomon. Solomon who built the temple of God. But, Moses, but the Most High God does not live in that house. Again, it was not a place where God would live. It was a place where God's presence was. That would, they could go and worship God there but he didn't live in it. David knew he couldn't live in it when he designed it, when he collected all the material. Solomon knew he couldn't, uh, Solomon knew he couldn't live in it, but the Israelite nation held such awe for that temple, each, for each one of his three permutations, that they just thought that was God. And Stephen is saying, no, no, again, you accept this temple, but you're not concerned about the God who lives in it, who, who shows his presence in it. But, okay, but Moses, uh, the Most High God, does not live in houses made by hands, as God says through the prophet, heaven is my throne, the earth is under my control. What kind of house will you build for me? Can you imagine that? Where are you going to get uh, enough lumber in all of the world to, to put a... a hut over God's big toe. He can't. He's too vast. Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. How are you going to find a place? Don't you under, uh, uh, didn't my hand make all the things that you're going to try to collect to, to build for me? You stubborn people, you won't obey. You won't listen. You are just like your people of long ago. You always oppose the Holy Spirit. That's what he's spending all this time talking. As he reviews the history of, of Israel, he's always saying, see, you reject God. And what you're doing right now is rejecting God. Was there ever a prophet uh, your people didn't try to get hurt? The answer is no. They tried to kill every one of them. Most of them were killed. Like uh, Shavira pointed out as she was working with Trudy, doing some stuff and putting up all the names of the apostles, uh, of the prophets. And they said, uh, boy, these are, some of these are hard names. And, and yeah, 
And she said, what, was this right, Trude? Is that my right? She said, yeah, hard names, hard life. Good summary. If you are, you're a prophet of God. You've got a hard life. Because people rejected what God ever had to say. Was there a, ever a prophet your people didn't try to hurt? They even killed those who told about the coming of the blameless one, the Messiah. And now you have handed him over to his enemies. You have murdered him. Same as usual, just as another rejection of God's men. You have murdered him. The law you received was given by angels, but you haven't obeyed it. That was the accusation, and they realized their fault, and that made them, oh, so mad. You hear the description, the description of, of what happened? When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they became very angry. They were so angry, they ground their teeth. And say, I don't know what that means. Ground their teeth. Is that it? I, I'm not sure, but they got so angry. They're probably just speaking at him without moving their, their teeth. God's glory, let's see. But he was full of the Holy Spirit and looked up into heaven and saw God's glory. He saw Jesus standing at God's right hand. Look, he said, I see the heaven open. The Son of Man is standing at God's right hand. When the, when the Sanhedrin heard this, they covered their ears and they yelled at the top of their voices. They, that's like a little kid, isn't it? You cover your ears and you hope you can't hear what anyone else is saying. And so blah, 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 blah. That's what they were doing, trying to block him out. They dragged him out of the city and they began to throw stones at him to kill him. The people who had brought false charges against Stephen took off their coats. They placed them at the feet of the young man uh, named Saul. While the members of the Sanhedrin were throwing stones at Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, don't hold the sin against them. When he said this, he died. So Stephen experienced the same accusations Jesus did. That's what they said about Jesus, that you came to destroy the temple, you came to destroy Judaism, and Judaism. You, you did it all, and that's the same accusations that he received. He received the same surrender of life. He said, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And and reflecting God's glory, the same appeal of forgiveness. And remember, the whole time he was talking, his face was glowing. An inner glow, or a light from above, we don't know. But remember the transfiguration? When Jesus was there talking with Moses, and the, the glow came from him, Maybe Jesus gave him some of that glow. As he appealed for forgiveness, as he appealed for the uh, Lord to take his life. I'm amazed at this sermon as it laces through it from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to David, from David to Jesus. All the rejections that the Israelites did. The thing is, they were faithful enough to bring Jesus into this land. And it is he who comes to save you and me. It is he who we say, Father, into our hands we commit our spirit. It is he who accepts us and makes us his children. We share that gospel. We have that gospel. We share it around the world. We've gone to different nations and just through William Jessup University, I think we probably reached all 195 nations with the gospel. Thank you for serving. Thank you for giving to help us with our missions. Thank you for praying every day for our missionaries. And if Jesus Christ is not your Savior, Look at all that he went through to be here for us. Look at all the rejection God received because of what he was doing. 
Don't reject him. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Don't say, I'll wait till later. Do it now. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, thank you so much for your wonderful word. And as we learn from Stephen, all that you've gone through and all that you did for people who were rejecting you constantly, Father, you're doing that for us. We know that. We know that you are doing that for us right now. And that if anyone is here wanting to reject again, Father, let them hear this word. And let them say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let them identify with him through the watery grave of baptism. Let them submit themselves to you, just like Stephen is. I believe, Father God, with all my heart, that everyone in this room who accepts you as Lord and Savior would do the same as Stephen did. Would stand up for you and surrender their life for you. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand up and let's sing All Fly Away because that's where we're going as Christians. We're going to fly away to heaven and leave the world behind and all its hate and all its misery and stand firm before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. faith lunch here because we have faith that there is lunch over there. So <laughs> there um, <laughs> uh, come on over and uh, share together. Uh, we were celebrating again Missions Sunday because of that, um, uh, Mission Emphasis Sunday. So there, there'll be, uh, we've invited everyone to bring their favorite ethnic dishes. And so come and let's just enjoy together the fellowship of the Lord. And of course, we're celebrating Dan's birthday coming up this uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Dan turning the big nine O. Wow. Yeah, right. So over there, we will all sing a happy birthday to him and to others in the church who are having their birthdays. And right now, let's uh, have a closing prayer and let's see. Oh, wait. I sat in the classroom at the end of this building all by myself for an hour, and nobody showed up. Nobody came to Bible study. We were going to set up what we want to study together. Well, you want to go on with my sermon, uh, discussing my sermons, or if you want a, a topic of some kind, or if you want to um, just 
study a book of the Bible, whatever it is you want to do, we'll do it. If you would love to, if you would like to join me at 9:30 every Sunday morning, right down. You know what? I think I'll change that to the the prayer room. It's got a nice circle of chairs that we can all sit comfortably in. So the prayer room, which is the second door from the end on this side of the building, on the what's that? That's the east side of the building. Okay, on the east side of the building, second door from the end is the prayer room. That's where we'll have our class. Come and join me at 9.30 on Sunday morning if you can. And these guys were here, but they were, they were studying God in another way. So, But if you can come, we'd love to have you come and be a part of that. Okay, I think that's everything. Now we can, oh, don't, don't forget, if you want to nominate someone for uh, leadership in the church, the requirement is what? That they be godly and spirit-led, that they be, they have a good reputation among the congregation, and that they have a good reputation in the community, right? And they love people. So let's go for that. Let's bow for prayer now. Pat, would, uh, Patrick, would you dismiss us? Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the examples you give us in your word. Thank you for Stephen. Thank you for his courage in standing up for you. Help us to stand up for you. Uh, among the people that we meet in this coming week. Uh, bless us, Lord. As we go, bring us back again next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I will sing forever of you, Lord. Come now with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. I once was blind, I could not see. Chains of sin had shackled me. But God in heaven heard my plea. And Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Oh, Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Sing forever of your love, come down with my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love, come down. Now, praise so sweet, it floods my soul. Hope eternal, won't let go. My daddy raced and Calvary, with Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Jesus, Jesus rescued me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. loves you.